in 2003, you guys released your self-titled album. I'm going to read just a few, a few accolades here. So that's your first okay. platinum album in Canada and first gold album in the U S so things, mm. things are progressing in the right direction since the yes. grayest of blue skies, there's five singles, good times, one thing, absent elements, stay in shadow, a thousand mile wish, two more Juno nominations, group of the year, single of the year. If I were to say that this is Finger Eleven's best album, right up there with Grace of Blue Skies, mm -hmm. would you agree with that? Or is that erroneous uh, on all accounts? No, uh, a couple of things. That to me is the best um, record for me as a drummer. I think it's, I think I had the most part of the writing in that record. And not that that makes it better or anything, but just a, that album is very rhythm uh, driven. A lot of the songs, not a lot of them. Some of the songs, you know, when we were um, writing them started as a drum groove and then sort of like absent elements, you know, the, those guitar parts and stuff are sort of built around the drum part. And th that didn't happen for any other reason. That's just what we were jamming that day and, you know, stuff like that came out, but I, I really love that record as a drummer. Um, baby's crying. Can you hear the baby in my audio? A little bit, but that's yeah. okay. okay. That's okay. Uh, you're that's, you're a, a proud new papa, so <laughs> yeah, we'll talk yeah. about that later. It's, okay. it's just, this is building the ambience for a segue yes. into that later on. Okay. So. Yeah. So the one thing about that record, so as a drummer, it's uh, I'm proudest of that one as far as the playing. But unfortunately, to be completely honest, I can't stand the sound of that record. I think it sounds like a demo, uh, you know? I, there's just no low end on the album. When I listen back to it now, I, it, it, it really sounds like a demo. Um, I'm not sure why that, you know, why we made that choice or we were cool with that at the time. Um, Sorry. Do you think, think, do you think that's the recording of the album, like the tracking, or do you think that's the mixing yeah. and mastering? What do you think that were the low end? Um, the falls mixing, short? mixing and mastering of it, you know, cause you, yeah we recorded with Johnny K the same guy that did the next record. Um, all those low ends were there. I think we were just going for an in the room band at that time, jamming in the room real time. You know, it's a rock and roll band. Um, and we achieved that. I just think those songs would have been better serviced with bigger production, but that's just my taste. That's just how I feel. You know, the other guys in, in the band, I'm sure have their own opinions, which there's no right or wrong answer, but, so as a drummer, my favorite parts I ever recorded and wrote as a songwriter, I feel the most um, connected with how those songs were constructed, but as production of a record, definitely my least favorite. So let's, let's dive into a few of the songs on that album. So uh, other light, it kicks off the album with other light. I believe yeah. th that song is in six, four, or at least part of it is in yeah. six, four yeah. is, is it harder to play different time signatures? So I'm asking for maybe people that aren't musicians. Is, is that harder to do, or it's just another time? Signature? No, it, we, we never wrote anything saying, Hey, let's do it in this time signature. Like I was saying a minute ago, a lot of the songs were just playing a groove in our little, our rehearsal room was Scott and Sean's parents' house in a bedroom. Um, a lot of the stuff just came from jamming and, you know, I was never counting or nobody in the band was ever counting. It was just, we were all, I guess, had been a band long enough that we were all in tune enough to know what our downbeat was. And that downbeat wasn't always a four, four downbeat. Um, so when we were in the studio, I think Johnny, the producer, sometimes would point out what the time signatures were. And I, I never really knew that. One cool thing about Other Light that maybe people don't know is not long before that, uh, Dave Williams from Drowning Pool had passed away. The singer? Those guys, yeah. Uh, those guys were and still are very, very close to me. Um, I'm still in touch with Mike, the drummer, very much. Still a dear friend of mine. And we were really close with Dave. Um, when he passed away, <clears throat> I think, it, you know, there was so much attention. They were, you know, doing really well at the time. And there was just so much media and stuff about that. Um, Mike and I was in Mike and I definitely Mike, the drummer called me and was like, Hey man, I know you guys are in Chicago. I, I gotta, I just want to get out of Dallas and just get away from all the shit. And because we were, you know, we had hung so much. I, 
I think he was comfortable asking, can you, can I come up to the studio and just not talk about that shit and just basically drink with us. So he flew up from Dallas and he stayed with us at least for a weekend. And he didn't realize, but before Dave passed away, Dave used to have this shovel on stage that on one of the songs, he would like smacked on the stage, you know, as a rhythm, whack, dun, dun, whack. And that was Dave Williams thing. At the end of that tour that we did together, uh, he signed it, all the guys signed it and he, they gave me, he gave me the shovel, which was his only shovel he ever did that um, with, I, I think before he passed away. So it's a really, uh, it's a treasured item that I have. Um, so in the studio, I had brought it for some reason. So while Mike was there on Other Light, one of the first hits you hear on that record or the first snare drum you hear on that record, maybe the first intro, underneath that snare drum is Dave's shovel. And we all went out and got super drunk and came back to the studio like three or four in the morning and we put something on the ground and Mike did. I can't remember what it was, but each guy in the band and Mike took turns down and whacked it down, down, whack, down, down, down. and we all and we put that into the song so it was our it was our quiet tribute to dave and drowning pool and uh i'm so proud we did that you know and it was a big moment for mike too i think it was a great healing moment and i'm just so honored we were part of that um i still have that shovel and i've talked to mike a bunch about this i don't want to have it i think that thing deserves to be in like a hard rock or something in Dallas. Cause it's Dave Williams. I, I certainly, I don't, you know, it doesn't belong in my house. So Mike knows this and I know this when the time, when it's the right time and I'm able to get it to him, I don't own that drowning pool on that shovel. And I want to give it back to them. I mean, it's been an honor taking care of it, but it's such a, to me, it's a part of heavy metal history that deserves to be up on a wall somewhere. So right now it's on my wall, but not permanently. I want to give it back to those guys and whatever they want to do with it, but it, it's drowning pools. That's their property, not mine. It was, it was so heartbreaking when, when he passed away. I mean, he's a young dude and, you know, bodies had just exploded a huge single. The album comes out doing well. The band is everything they've ever wanted is coming. And you find out that the, the singer passed away at a young age, man, that was, I remember that was a tough one. Yeah. And he was uh, one of those guys that everybody loved. You know, he was uh, when he walked into a room, he would light the room up. And, you know, his good friends were Vinny and Dimebag and they had the same personalities. And those guys were the first guys to take us to Vinny's house, Vinny Paul's house when we were in Dallas. Um, you know, I remember I think it was Dave and Mike. We were at Dimebag strip club in Dallas. And I think it was Mike leaning over like, dude, do you want to go to Vinny Paul's house tonight? And you know, so it, Drowning Pool are the reason I got to to meet Dimebag and Vinny and not just meet them, go party at their house. And we got to play Pantera's gear. I, when Vinny Paul went to bed, he just kind of left us in his house and upstairs at his crazy mansion that he has. He had all the Pantera gear set up to, you know, to rehearse. So at like four o'clock in the morning, I was playing Vinny Paul's drums and uh, James or Rick were playing Dimebag's guitar and we were just jamming on Pantera's gear in Vinnie Paul's house. So all of that happened because of Drowning Pool. Wow. I'm, uh, I'm going to read the next question because it's a little bit longer okay. and I don't want to uh, miss okay. any parts of it. So okay. uh, the song Complicated Questions, that's one of my favorite songs on that album. Um, great drums for the verse. And then when it gets heavy during the part, the tear out this love part, like that part's so badass. Mm -hmm. Um I believe that your drum playing is what makes the song unique. Do you remember coming up with your drum parts for that song? Uh, was the song built around the bass and the verse and the guitar and the chorus? Like those are all the things that jump out in that song for me. Um, again, so to be completely honest on everything, that beat in the verse was taken from a glue leg song from Toronto from their first record. I think, I don't know, I think it was an independent record. It's similar beat that used to, I used to always imitate the beat and always wanted to use it somewhere. I don't know if it's the exact same thing, but it was derived from a glue leg song. And I think again, like I was saying before, just at a rehearsal, just jamming stuff, I started playing that groove and the guitar parts are picking up, you know, on the kick drum pattern. So it, it, it derived from a drum beat, but not with any intention of that being a tricky part. It was just, a uh, a similar groove to something that I really loved about a glue leg song. 
who, who are such a great band. And like I was saying, that's how so many of those songs were written on that record, even though they were sometimes tricky parts, they weren't meant to be. They were just um, in the moment that maybe I was trying to do something not so much tricky, but something unique. Um, Cause we wrote that record took so long to write. I mean, we were up in that Scott and Sean's parents' house for well over a year writing songs. We had like 60 songs or something ideas. Um, so probably after a while, we were just trying to keep interested and try different things. And that complicated questions thing, um, you know, came up And the chorus part. That was another part of the song where uh, the second half of each part are everything's following the drums. Check it, 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 check it. Every, every chorus, I think, does a different thing. And uh, that's just what we started becoming. Um, really from first time on grace of blue skies picking up those dan and check dan and check i think those judges um i know i started hearing those in a lot of songs later not to say that we were the first to do that or or people took that from us nothing like that but i i just remember us doing that and then hearing it uh you know all the time and it was maybe just that's what people were doing at the time but you know fast forward to that record we had then even more so started picking up, you know, some of the bass drum patterns, the guys were accenting. And I think that definitely created some of the interesting time signatures and just sort of musical, you know, the drum parts and guitar parts of that record. So it was a very musical record, um, but not necessarily because it was meant to be, we weren't trying to be tricky. We were just trying to be interesting. Did you, did you, do you feel like you had more of a contribution to this album versus greatest of blue skies? Yeah, I had, I mean, I don't, I didn't, I don't have really anything to do with Grace of Blue Skies. I was so young and new to the band. I was doing what I was told, which was okay. I, I, I needed to be told that. Um, I, I really had no confidence back then. I was new enough to the band that I didn't have a voice or at least one that I was comfortable voicing at the time. So yeah, the, the self-titled record, we were, I was more comfortable in my position and place in the band and more comfortable suggesting things. And, and again, just the way we had wrote that, like I was, you know, just describing, it just happened to be a lot of those rhythms came from my drum parts. So kind of, therefore I had more contribution, contribution to those parts. So it was a fun time, man. We, like I said, we spent so much fucking time, <laughs> like over a year in this uh, bedroom that was like infested with flies, like infested with flies. And we would all be, well, at least the four of us would all of our shirts off. We'd be covered in flies. And, we, you know, we just got so used to it. It was like, you know, in the 80s, you'd see those um, Ethiopian commercials, those off, you know, heartbreaking commercials. And um, there's flies all over those poor kids. We were like that. Um, a lot of those songs were written covered in flies. <laughs> it, it reminds me of the Amityville horror movies yeah. where the, yes. there was flies all over the, the windows yeah. in, in the rooms that were, were haunted. Yeah, I can't even describe to you. It was that many flies. I mean, it, it was over the top. I'm sure there's video of it. Around that time when I first bought a video camera too. So I have almost everything from that self-titled record up till the end of me being in the band um, videotaped. I have all those videos here. I mean, I, I have probably hundreds and hundreds of hours that nobody has seen of us traveling the world. You know, Probably some of it nobody should see. But, you know, I, one day I want to get somehow get that all edited because I have like the ultimate finger 11 home video sitting right here beside me right now in this room um, that I hope one day I can get someone to put together with, with the guy's permission. Of course, I wouldn't just do that on my own, but make to make sure that they would be OK with that, too. That, but, that, that reminds me of the new Kanye West documentary on Netflix. I think it's called Genius. And it's uh, some that. someone that filmed like. 20 years of Kanye West, like before he was big all the way up to being the biggest star in the world. And it just shows like everybody turning him down. No one believed in him as, as a rapper, except him, like that huge confidence uh -huh. and ego. Like somehow he always had that despite the world telling him that that's, that's not you. So anyways, right. it, it, you know, someday it's like, it's, you have all the content to put out the equivalent yeah, of the for sure. Kanye West genius documentaries. So. Yeah. I haven't seen that. I got to check that out, but yeah, definitely. Um, at some point I'd like to talk to the guys about, you know, doing that as a team, having someone edit that, but that's something I would never, 
you know, I, I would include them if I ever did that because that's all of us, you know, that's not my property. It's our property. So. so continuing to move through the songs on the album, how much fun was it to play good times live with the awesome Tom work in the verses mm-hmm. with the awesome snare work and the breakdown? Right. Was that, was it a good time to play good times live? Yeah, well, here's a funny story about that one. Uh, while we were writing that record that I'm talking about him, Scott and Sean's parents, bedroom one of their bedrooms um wind up records i guess we're gonna put out the soundtrack for daredevil the movie um so they had sent us a clip of that movie still with the time code on it and stuff like just an edit and the scene was um ben affleck up in the fan at a bar and kind of watching everybody and then i think knocking out the lights and fighting all these guys in a bar so it was like a, a two minute or three minute sequence and they had asked us whoever i don't know it's a studio or who would have done that movie but if we could write a song around that scene to be in the soundtrack so good times we were all sitting there watching the scene of ben affleck jumping down from the fan and you know fighting everybody and the first thing i did as i'm watching it was like on my bass drum of floor tom i was watching it again and that's literally where that song came from is a ben affleck scene in daredevil so the song was created around that Tom thing that you're talking about while watching that mo- that movie little sequence. And once we recorded it, we went to Los Angeles um, before we finished the self-titled record. To, we had met Johnny Kay, the producer, and we were going to do that song for the Daredevil soundtrack. And if things worked out, we were going to use him as a producer for the whole self-titled record. So we went to Los Angeles and we recorded that and um, Sad Exchange. So we thought Good Times was going to be on the Daredevil soundtrack and we thought Sad Exchange was going to be on the Finger Eleven record. And we just had the budget to ro- record an extra song. That's why we did Sad Exchange. And I guess when it was finished, it was reversed. Sad Exchange was on the soundtrack and Good Times was on the record and be- you know became the first single off the record. So. Again, that was another song that was recorded a whole different time as the rest of the record at a whole different studio in Los Angeles. Um, the rest of the album was done in Chicago. So that's how that that's the backstory on all that. So with hindsight being 2020, now that Par- Paralyzer is out, it's a big single. So I'm I'm OK, this will make sense in a second. So OK. Now that Paralyzer is a song, it's a big single. This is out looking back mm-hmm. to good times. I see it as like the pre good times is the precursor to paralyzer where good times is like a hint of a change in musical direction for more of the dance, dance rock stuff that's coming. Do you see good times as a turning point? Uh, When you say that for sure, uh, like everything in our band, nothing was planned. Um, You know, I can see how that happened, but really, if, if we were to say that, I suppose Ben Affleck's Daredevil was the is what eventually <laughs> inspired us to write songs like Paralyzer. Um, I think maybe it opened us opened us up to we weren't in a box of what the band was known to do. I, uh, you know, writing for so long on that record and so many different kinds of songs, I think that's when the band um could visualize our sound just not being one thing, not just being a heavy band, having some different influences, whether it were country stuff, because a couple of the guys were becoming even more fans of country music, um, which they eventually, you know, became Blackie Jacket Jr. So I think, yeah, it was uh, it leading from Paralyzer leading up to Paraly- Paralyzer, good times leading up to Paralyzer, I think was, you can see the evolution of the band just getting more comfortable trying new things if that makes any sense yeah so so good times was a big hit in canada i believe it went to number one on on different rock uh rock charts um but it it wasn't breaking through in the u.s and you're signed to wind up which is a big label in the u.s with with creed and evanescence and and uh is it 12 stones and seether and all these guys they're 12 stones yep Yep. yeah so so the, there there starts to be pressure from wind up of, of okay big in Canada but what's going on in the US so you right. guys decide to kind of take a gamble you know good times is is probably the best rock song we have and it's not doing what we want in the US 
let's just go all the way to the other end and re- release one thing an acoustic song if this doesn't work let's try this um right. and and everything worked out and we'll talk about that but was there any fear of releasing an acoustic song as a single for a band that's built this image that's a bit darker and a bit heavier well i guess just another tidbit about good times i i, I gotta mention because it all flows into one thing Good Times was the first um, video that we spent a big budget on. Um, well, Wind Up did that. All of the videos we did on um, on Tip, which was only three or four videos, they were done for relatively cheap. Uh, back then, a video, a small budget budget video, would be like thirty five grand. And back in the day, a big budget would be a million dollars or seven hundred grand or something, which is hilarious because nowadays thirty five grand is what most certainly rock bands spend on videos. Um, but you know, Guns N' Roses were making $3 million videos. And of course all the like Beyonce's or Justin Timberlake's were November making. rain or something. Yeah. yeah. So we'd always, um, you know, I guess, I don't know if we always wanted to do a big budget video, but we just never had the chance. Um, wind up. That was the first song that they gave us a huge budget. And we went to that ice hotel in Quebec and this, I can't remember the director's name, but he did a couple of corn videos. So it would, we stepped up the video part of the band. Um, I think big time on that. And I think we saw the success of that, not so much on radio, but just the, the image of the band. If you can, I think if you make the band look bigger than it is in a video, um, I, I think the label got that and they were, they knew that one thing they believed in one thing, but they thought, you know, having a big budget video along with a song they believed in, they could see how the two work together. Um, so we were lucky enough to make a really big, even more big budget video with one thing, but that song, when we, well, I didn't write it, James and Scott, I think went on a camping trip and came back and showed us that song. But when we all heard it, it was like, we all knew that was going to be a hit. It reminded me of a Peter Gabriel song. It was very Peter Gabriel-esque to me. Um, I can't remember what song, if it was like Salisbury Hill or something, but <clears throat> I, I immediately thought, yeah, that's, that's a radio hit for sure. But th- that was all Scott and, uh, and Jay's song. So yeah, um, almost just like paralyzed, you know, when I first heard Scott sing that chorus, I knew I called Rob Lanny, our manager and told him, and he remembers this too. You know, I think we just had like a verse and a chorus with Scott singing the chorus. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's a hit. So we felt the same thing with one thing as well. So one thing comes out, it's your mainstream breakthrough in the U S I believe it goes to number 16 on the billboard top 100. It's top 10 on three different U S charts. Um, I was going to ask if you could have predicted that that song would resonate with so many people. And, and you just said that you did yeah. think that it had the, the possibility. Uh, and you mentioned that, uh, you know, Scott went away and came back with the song. Rick said that that's the first song that didn't feel like it was finger 11. Like it felt like a gift that was given to the band and didn't feel it. it, it, Yeah. It felt like a gift from the gods. Like here, here's your big breakthrough, do what you can with this and not so much like finger 11 trying to make that song. Yeah, sure. I mean, definitely. I, I, to me, you know, those guys going away on a camping trip, there was a different dynamic of Scott and Rick and uh, James together. And there always was that they had a different relationship than the other guys in the band had with one another as songwriters. <clears throat> I think they were the most, um, well, I guess the, I think they were the best songwriters in the band. So them going off on a camping trip just specifically to write songs together. Um, they came back with uh, stay in shadow, uh, like an acoustic version of stay in shadow and one thing. So I'd say it was more a gift from Scott and Jay, not from the gods, you know, but it was because they had time to be on their own and not so much be finger 11 guys, just be two best friends around a campfire writing songs. And they came back with that. So it it definitely was outside the box of finger 11 because it was outside the box of finger 11. 